Hello, uh, welcome to Bruegel for uh, this event on how should we measure uh, the digital economy. And I'm very excited uh, to be here with you uh, because um, uh, it, is, it happens to be to have a presentation of, of a research that I know. I'm a research fellow at Bruegel, but I'm also a postdoctoral um, fellow at uh, MIT Sloan at uh, the digital lab there. And there I had the pleasure to meet Avinas Collins and get to know his research on uh, the topic, on how should uh, we measure digital economy. And I think it's a very exciting piece of research to be presented in Brussels uh, in front of this audience. And I think uh, there is also a lot of discussion, uh, policy discussion that can be, uh, um, can be relevant to that. So Avi is a doctoral candidate at MIT Sloan. He's currently in the job market. That means travels a lot. And we are thankful that he had time to uh, be with us. And then uh, I'm also very happy because um, the composition of the panel is ideal on this topic because we have uh, experts uh, that uh, can cover um, this topic from uh, a different way in uh, uh, different uh, aspects, but uh, in a, a very uh, high quality, with a very high quality approach. And we have uh, uh, Nadine Ahmad, uh, who is the head of the Trade and Productivity Statistics Division in OECD. And uh, I mean, what what is um, one of the questions is uh, how should measure digital economy, but uh, even uh, it is even more challenging to discuss how we can bring these measures into official statistics. And uh, uh, I hope uh, we'll get into there and we'll have some insightful comments. And then we have uh, in alphabetical order, Eline Sivod, who is a senior uh, policy analyst um, at the ITIF's uh, Center um, for Data Innovation. So um, if you want to, to discuss about data and policy, Eline is here and actually is a rising star in Brussels. I, I meet here everywhere talking about this topic, so I'm very happy that uh, is here with us. And um, of course, um, uh, David Nguyen uh, is uh, the senior economist uh, on the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence, uh, which is based in the UK, and uh, who, ha who is very active in research uh, on this topic. And uh, uh, he, he can, I was talking with him before we start, and uh, it is uh, amazing the variety and the number of topics related to data that he's involved, and I'm looking forward for the, uh, his intervention. So we'll start with Avi's presentation. So Avi, please go ahead, and then we'll have the panel discussion. Uh, thanks, Yorgos, and uh, thanks to the Bruegel team for setting this up, and thanks to all of you for coming to my talk. So I will present to you some of the work I've been doing in my PhD dissertation. And the fundamental point, uh, the motivating fact behind my research is this fact that we see the digital revolution all around us except in macroeconomic statistics. So one of the most fundamental questions in economics is how are we doing? Traditionally, we look at metrics such as GDP and other metrics which we derive from GDP such as productivity, look at changes in these metrics over time, and use the, them as proxies for changes in well-being. If GDP grows up, it's seen as, you know, we are better off overall in terms of well-being. If GDP goes down, you know, we think of it as like, you know, probably not good for the well-being of the economy. But it's important to note that GDP and productivity are measures of production. They are not meant to measure welfare or well-being. You can infer welfare and well-being pretty well in many cases from these metrics but they're not meant to directly measure welfare. In fact, uh, the creator of GDP, Simon Kuznets himself, warned us against not using it as a welfare metric, but we continue to use it because of lack of better alternatives. This relationship between GDP and like well-being was probably a pretty good like, correlation for most of the 20th century when we had goods, physical goods with prices and quantities and people paid a positive price to use them. But when we look at the relationship between technology and GDP, what we see is now we have an explosion of lots of free digital goods. Most of us spend several hours online every day on platforms such as Facebook, Google, Wikipedia. We don't pay directly a price to use them. And if the price of a product is zero, it shows up approximately zero times in GDP. Now, some of these platforms have advertisement revenues, and I will talk about that in a second. But platforms such as Wikipedia are truly free. Users spend time on these platforms, get value from using them. But because the price is zero, it doesn't show up in GDP. If you look at the share of the 
If you look at the share of the information sector as a percentage of GDP, it has remained at around 4 to 5 percent for the last 40 years. All of us would agree that technology plays a much bigger role in our overall lives now than it did 40 years ago. But if we try to infer how well we are doing from using all these technologies, we might not reach the right answer if we just look at GDP. This is data for US, but this relationship holds true for most of the advanced economies. The relationship between GDP and well-being not properly correlated can get even worse when we have free goods substituting goods which we used to pay prices for. A really good example of this is an ad of Radio Shack from 1992. So Radio Shack used to be an electronics store in the US, you know, like Best Buy and other stores. So it went bankrupt, so it doesn't exist anymore. But every ad in this, uh, every product in this ad is now a free app on our smartphone. So we used to spend several hundreds or even thousands of dollars to buy, you know, things such as uh, like a video player, audio player, a GPS device, uh, landline phones, computers, calculators. Now we get all of these services as free apps on our smartphone. And as a result of this shift, because we used to pay, you know, in fact, if you add up the price of all these goods in this ad, it's over $6,000 in 1992. And now we get all of this bundled into a smartphone for free. And as a result of this shift, the contribution of this technology sector to GDP would go down. But consumers are clearly better off because now they have access to all these products for free and they consume them in larger quantities because price has fallen. So let's look at a few examples of when GDP and consumer welfare or well-being are correlated and when they might not be correlated. So if you take classic goods, you know, goods with positive prices and quantities, basically most of the goods of the 20th century, if you look at the demand curve for such goods, you know, downward sloping demand curve, a positive price P and a quantity Q, this rectangle here is the value of the total value which is captured by the firm, which is the producer surplus. The triangle on top is the extra value consumers get on top of what they pay for these products, which is a consumer surplus. The consumer surplus measures how well people are from using this good. And let's say you double the consumption of a particular physical good. So this rectangle area doubles, so that would show up in GDP. The triangle area on top also roughly doubles, so consumers are also roughly double better off. So changes in GDP and changes in consumer welfare would go in the same direction. When we have free digital goods, the price goes down to zero. And let's say you are using maps on your smartphone and you start using it twice the amount or as you did in the previous time period. So if you double the consumption of such free goods, your consumer surplus triangle area doubles, you're roughly double better off. But because price is zero, GDP wouldn't change as a result of this increase in consumption. So these things need not be correlated in that case. And then it gets even worse when goods transition from paid physical goods to free digital goods. And a really good example of this is the encyclopedia industry. Like many of us used to spend several thousands of dollars and buy all those volumes of Britannica. Now we get all of that knowledge for free and more on Wikipedia because it has more quantities of articles than uh, Britannica ever had. As a result of this shift, this rectangle area would go down to zero, so GDP would go down, but consumers are clearly better off because before they had this triangle as consumer surplus, and now they have all of that as consumer surplus. So consumer welfare would increase as a result of this shift, but the contribution of the encyclopedia industry would, to GDP would go down. So not only are GDP and well-being need not be correlated, but in fact, they might even go in the opposite directions when free goods substitute paid digital goods. Some of these uh, platforms have advertisement revenues, but it's important to note that advertisement revenues and consumer welfare need not be correlated either. Uh, previous research shows that, you know, let's say you have two groups of users, one who really gets a lot of value from using Facebook and other, or, or Google or any other platform. Another person gets much less value from using these platforms. And you show the same ad to both of them, and you would get the same amount of revenue from both of them. But one person gets much more consumer surplus or consumer welfare than the other. So advertisement revenues and consumer surplus need not be correlated. In fact, if you look at the share of the advertisement industry as a percentage of GDP, it has remained at 1% for the last 100 years. 
There is, of course, shift from print and physical to digital, but the total share is pretty much similar. So in my research, what we do is instead of inferring welfare from measures of production, we go and directly measure welfare. And the way we do it is by running lots of online choice experiments. We can do this at a very large scale. So fundamentally, these are survey-based questions. You could do several hundred thousand of these every day. And these methods let us estimate how much people value all these different digital goods. And the key choice experiment works like this. So consumers already have access to a free good, let's say Facebook, and they're asked to make a choice between keeping access to that good or giving it up in exchange for a certain cash amount. So let me uh, illustrate that with a quick example. So how many of you in the room use Facebook? Okay, so around uh, 60, 70%. So for those of you, you who use Facebook, would you give it up for a month in exchange for $1? How about uh, $50? How about uh, $500? OK, so the valuation of Facebook in this room is somewhere, the median valuation is somewhere between $50 and $500. So we do exactly such experiments by asking people, how much would we have to pay them to give up Facebook or Google or Wikipedia or any of these platforms? And we do these in an incentive compatible way. So it's not a simple hypothetical question, but if someone says that they'll give up Facebook for $5, then we go and enforce their choices. They get real cash after we verify that they give these platforms up for the period of time which we mentioned. So aggregating responses from lots of such questions lets us estimate demand curves for these products, even when there are no prices. So this is what we did with Facebook. So we have been measuring how much people value Facebook for the last four or five years. So we get a representative sample of online population. Uh, one uh, drawback of this approach is that because we do all of our studies online, we can only reach people who are online. And around 15% of the US population is offline, like they don't use internet. So uh, we reach people who are online and get a representative sample of users. And then we do a study looking at how much they value Facebook. And we enforce, as I was mentioning, incentive compatibility. So if someone says that they will give up Facebook for $5 or $10, then they might have to actually follow up on their choice in exchange for real cash. So let's look at some of the results of how much people value Facebook in the US. So this is the demand curve for Facebook. So on the x-axis, we have the percentage of key people who choose to keep Facebook in exchange, you know, and reject the cash amount. On the y-axis, we have the dollar amounts which we offer them. So as you can see, for as little as a dollar, around 20% gives it up for a month of Facebook. Around 20% doesn't give it up for as high as $1,000. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of valuations. In terms of the median valuation, what we find is that in 2016, when we ran this study, Facebook was valued by the median American at around $48. Since then, the valuation is falling a lot, uh, 37, 28. And like this year, when we ran it, it was around $19. Um, and if we, we can also look at which groups of people get most of the value from Facebook. So not only can we look at this demand curve and area under the demand curve, but we can also look at which groups get more welfare than the others. So we also look at which groups to get more value. And what we find is that you know, if you spend more time on Facebook, or if you have a bigger network, if you, you know, if have a bigger network effects on Facebook, um, or if you watch lots of videos or post more on Facebook, you seem to value it more. Women seem to value it more than men. And interestingly, also older people seem to value it more than younger people. And we were a bit puzzled by the result. And so we did a few interviews. And what we found is that if you're older, you don't have substitutes to Facebook. And that's the only way you stay in touch with your family. And younger people seem to readily give it up in exchange for migrating to Snapchat or uh, TikTok, which is a new uh, app. Uh, we also see which other apps they use and how that impacts their valuation of Facebook. So that lets us look at substitutes and complements across different apps. So what we find is that if you use Instagram and YouTube more, you seem to value Facebook less. So these platforms seem to be substitutes to Facebook. So we could do such choice experiments also to measure network effects on Facebook. So we also ask questions of the type of how much would we have to pay you to give up like half of your network or a fourth of your network or all male friends or all female friends. And asking for choice experiments also quant lets us quantify 
how much of this is value is due to the network versus how much of it is due to the product itself uh, besides your network. We did more experiments looking at how much people value other popular goods such as WhatsApp, Snapchat, and Instagram in uh, Europe at, uh, in a university lab setting in Netherlands. So let's see how much people value these goods in Europe. So we were very surprised by this result, but the median European in our sample needed over 500 euros to give up WhatsApp for a month. And we were really surprised by how high the number was, so we went and did a bunch of interviews. So while in the US, most people still use SMS, like as you all know, in Europe and rest of the world, they basically seem to live on instant messaging. It's, so subjects reported that you know you use WhatsApp to for both your professional and personal lives, you know, to set up appointment with your babysitter or to like uh, set up you know uh, an appointment with your friend, and it's really an essential part of your life, and it seems to be very hard for them to give it up for a month. In this sample in Europe, we find that Facebook is over 90 euros. Maps, being able to use Google Maps or uh, Apple Maps on your phone, was at around uh, 59 euros. On the other end, we have Twitter and Skype with very low valuations. So these are median valuations. Uh, so there is also, as you can see, a lot of heterogeneity among apps. We also did more studies for other popular goods. So let's see, for example, for Wikipedia. So the median, uh, this is again in the US, the median valuation of Wikipedia for a year is around $150. That translates to around $15 billion of consumer surplus a year, which is pretty high given the fact that it's a truly free good, like no ads, completely built by volunteers, um, and raises some money through donations of the order of, I think, 30, 40 million. But compared to that, it generates over $15 billion of surplus. So there is a lot of welfare which consumers get from using Wikipedia, which wouldn't show up in GDP or productivity. We did more studies looking at how much would we have to pay people to give up for a full year entire categories of goods, you know, so let's say search engines or email or maps. So, you know, the question is, would you give up like, you know, all of Google and Face, like Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo, all search engines for a year or all email for a year? So the valuations were not surprisingly pretty high. And what we find is that the median American gets around $15,000 of value from search engines a year, which is pretty high given the fact that you also need it you know, to use it for your work. So many, most of the valuation here is probably coming from work use. We can also split the question into how much of that value is at work versus outside work, and that lets us look at you know, how much is you know, the valuation from outside work activities. Uh, email and maps are also highly valued, and on the other end, we have social media, messaging, and music, which are also significantly highly valued, but an order of magnitude less. And across the board, we see that over time, the valuations of these categories are increasing. So I showed you that Facebook valuation is falling, but for the entire category of social media and other platforms, the total valuation for the full category seems to be increasing. And we can also look at which groups, again, get the most value for, from using these platforms. And what we find, not surprisingly, is that if uh, there is a strong correlation between income and valuation of search engines and email, presumably because uh, as the more you're paid, like the more likely you're to do a knowledge job which would require use of these services. For e-commerce, we, what we find is that if you live in a rural area, you seem to get much more value than if you live in an urban area. For social media and video and some of these entertainment type apps, interestingly, we don't find any correlation with income. If you are uh, lower income or higher income, you seem to get a comparably uh, similar amounts of magnitude of valuation. So we also did some studies looking at non-digital goods, so physical goods, and we did a study looking at how much people value breakfast cereal. So this is inspired by a long literature in economics in the 90s trying to quantify consumer surplus from different varieties of breakfast cereal. So we wanted to see how much would we have to compensate people to give up cereal for a year. This is not an incentive compatible study, so this was a hypothetical uh, choice survey experiment. So what we find is that the median American gets around $50 of consumer surplus or welfare from being able to consume breakfast cereal, which translates to around $15 billion of welfare per year. Uh, if you look at the cereal industry, it generates around $10 billion in the U.S. per year. So the extra area of the triangle on top of what's captured in the national accounts 
is comparable. So you get, you know, $10 billion shows up in GDP, the extra $15 billion on top, which is the consumer welfare, is reasonably well correlated. So for physical goods with prices, looking at GDP and productivity and inferring like welfare might not be that problematic. So what do we do with all these valuations? You know, so we did a bunch of studies quantifying how much people value these goods. And in a follow-up paper, we convert all these valuations back into the GDP framework and develop a new welfare, uh, macroeconomic welfare metric, which we call GDPB, where B stands for benefits. So GDP measures production. It does a great job at measuring production. In this paper, we develop a new metric, GDPB, which accounts for all the well-being and welfare we get from being able to use new and free digital goods. So putting our estimates back into this framework, what we find is that for Facebook, for Facebook, you know, so in 2003, Facebook was created, so, you know, it didn't create any value. It was valued at zero because it didn't exist. In 2017, when we ran the studies, it was valued at around 40 to $50 a year. So that leads to an extra 0.05 percentage of growth in our GDP B metric, which is the welfare metric. So GDP already captures the production side of Facebook. And then on top of that, GDP growth of 1.83% for the US, on top of that, there's an extra 0.05% per year growth in welfare due to the availability of Facebook. And then, you know, in the, for Europe, like we did studies for WhatsApp and other products. So here we had to make some assumptions of the number of users who use these services. And for WhatsApp, as I was showing, like, you know, it's a huge amount of value over 500 euros a month that translates to around 1% to 4% of GDP B growth. Uh, the reason these figures are pretty high is because of the fact that WhatsApp is probably substituting uh, your phone and SMS usage. And while the drop in valuations of those other older products with prices is captured in GDP, this to account for the benefits we get from free WhatsApp, we have to adjust it by a bigger amount so that they, you know, we reach the current welfare metric. For Facebook, we find that you know around 0.1 to 0.5 percent of extra growth. This is in Netherlands where we did the study, uh, and for Maps and like you know, as well, it's pretty significant. For other apps, like it's much lower. So the what so what is the idea behind all this research? So what we are trying we are not trying to say that you know you should replace GDP. GDP does a great job at measuring production. What we're trying to show is that if you want to look at the well-being of the economy as a whole, we should look at a series of metrics instead of one number. So on one end, you have GDP, which measures the production side of the economy very well. Our metric GDPB looks at the welfare side of it, so the economic well-being side of how much you, know, you get benefits you get from you being able to use these digital goods. On the other end, we have you know, well-being metrics such as happiness and life satisfaction scores, which are meant to truly measure your well-being and which all of us you know, care about the most probably. But the challenge with these life satisfaction and happiness metrics are that by definition, they are subjective. So they are not as precise as the GDP metrics which are calculated. Our GDP B metric is not as precise as GDP, but it's relatively more uh, objective than subjective, uh, like well-being metrics. So the idea is to, you know, policymakers should look at this series of metrics on a dashboard rather than looking at one number when they are trying to optimize some decision. So you know, let's say you are driving a car or like flying a plane. You, the dashboard doesn't show you one number, but it shows you a series of metrics, and you have to look at all of them, you know, in order to make the right decision. Otherwise, you might reach like some, have some problem. So to conclude, you know, we, we are still using a production metric developed like over 80 years ago to infer well-being. This was probably not problematic for most of the 20th century, but now with the explosion of the digital revolution, where we have access to free goods. We should be looking at direct measures of welfare, and by running our online choice experiments, that's one way of directly measuring how much people value these goods, and you could use that to see how much people are better off from an economic well-being point of view. Uh, thank you. So the papers are on the website. You can read up them if you're interested. Thank you. Uh,
Thank you very much, uh, Avi. I mean, uh, what I found particularly interesting is that uh, we put uh, also some numbers, uh, and also I learned something about you, how much you value Facebook. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that is important uh, to talk with numbers, because uh, when we go to statistics, numbers are important and the exact uh, values of that. Allow me one, two questions before I move to uh, Nadim. So you mentioned during the, uh, the presentation that um, uh, the advertising revenue is not proportional on the consumer welfare. However, uh, in um, uh, the, uh, the f type of firms uh, you focus are uh, uh, two-sided markets, and there are network externalities from the one side to the other. So on the one side, we have the user that visits these websites. On the other, we have the advertisers that try to reach uh, 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 to sh the users, potential consumers. So when we include these network externalities, is still uh, advertising revenue a bad measure of consumer welfare? Uh, so fundamentally, as I was mentioning, uh, there is no law which states that it should be correlated because the amount of money you can capture by showing better ads or better targeted ads need not be correlated with how much some, like someone gets uh, you know, in value from using the full platform. So let's say some, person, some people are more likely to click on ads. You might capture more money from them, but it doesn't mean that they value Facebook more than others who don't, uh, you know, uh, like click on ads. So by, there's no law which states that they should be correlated. So you know, if you want to look at the advertisement side of the multi-sided platform, then we should look at ad revenues. If you want to look at the total welfare generated by Facebook, we should look at each of these components. And advertisement side is definitely important. But there's also research done by Bill Nordhaus who shows that for most of the technological innovations of the 20th century, only around 3 to 4% of the total surplus went to firms, while the rest, 97%, went to consumers. So that side might be like, significantly smaller than like, what value people get. I see. And your measure, uh, I understand, is as a direct uh, measure on the valuation. And uh, on the top of that, we could have uh, an indirect uh, contribution by, by using a platform. I come in touch with uh, producers of goods and I transact with them. And I guess these transactions are captured by the official statistics so far. Right. They would be indirectly captured. Let's say a firm uh, shows an ad. Uh, that advertisement revenues themselves would be intermediate goods, so they wouldn't directly show up. But the ad revenue would show up in the prices of the goods, which would be captured by official statistics. And on the other side, we have, as you said, WhatsApp substituting uh, some of the telecom uh, services, which means that uh, by capturing only the telecom services, uh, we miss more by not having WhatsApp because we have this negative externality. Uh, exactly. So basically, you know, goods with prices like telephones and like how much we pay for, you know, SMS and call, phone calls, that's captured in the macroeconomic measures. But if, let's say, you start using texting less and less because now you text on WhatsApp, the prices of those goods, like or the amount of revenues you get from SMS, would fall down. But to adjust for the welfare, you have to account for this thick line in valuation of a good which is being substituted, plus the extra valuation which the new free good would provide. So that adjustment terms gets much bigger. Exactly. So the broad message is that we miss a lot by not considering an official statistics. But only from the welfare side. So yeah. I want to make it clear this yeah. is looking at the welfare side of the yeah. equation. Exactly. Um, so how we can capture this welfare side, Nadim? Um, well, I'll, I'll come to that in my, in my discussion. But, but I appreciate Avi's uh, qualification that we're not missing it necessarily. We're just not measuring it. I mean, there's a, there's a difference, I think, in terms of the terminology that we're using in terms of what's missing from GDP and what's not being measured. Um, because it, as, you, as you stated quite clearly, um, you know, GDP as a concept is set out to measure one thing, and welfare is a different concept. Now, of course, in practice, many use GDP as a measure of welfare, um, and that's not what should be done. I, I, want, I wanted to start my intervention perhaps um, more, more explicitly in, in reference to a point that you made, and I think it's a very good starting point, um, where you said that we see it everywhere, we see digitalization everywhere, except in macroeconomic statistics. And I think that is true, um, but it's not true in perhaps the way that many usually interpret it. They see we can't see it, so you're not measuring it, which isn't, isn't really the case. I mean, what's, we have a, perhaps an archaic way of describing the economy um, in terms of the classification of firms and the classification of products, in the accounts, and so when people look for the digital economy, they don't see it because we're not defining firms as digital enterprises or digital products and digital services. And so they, they conclude that perhaps it's not there, and they conclude perhaps it's not there because we see 
a productivity slowdown and we have this new productivity paradox and people are trying to, to work out what's going on and they conclude, well, I don't see it, ergo, it's not there. Um, now, that's not the conclusion that official statisticians um, have drawn. I mean, we've taken away from that that we need to perhaps have greater visibility in the accounts um, to redefine perhaps the way that we show certain activities, to have new classifications that refer to a whole subset of digital industries, digital intermediation platforms, um, digital goods providers, digital services providers. And so this is a different way perhaps of thinking about how we can respond um, to that question. Now, there's no doubt that there are issues around the valuation of free services. Um, but again, I mean, the, the view that we have certainly is in macroeconomic statistics and official statistics is that the valuation of free is a concept that's important for measures of welfare um, and less relevance in the context of GDP, which, which, which still has to remain a tool um, for macroeconomic policy making. And, and if we allow ourselves to say that let's redefine GDP, so we include within it a whole range of free services, um, then we do a disservice to those who want to perhaps look at instruments like monetary policy to manage the economy. It won't, it won't work in quite the same way. And, and these are discussions that have been in perhaps the, the national accounts area for decades. It's, you know, digital isn't new in that sense. It's presenting perhaps an exacerbation of old problems. I mean, but let, let's just frame perhaps the discussion around the old to consider the new. I mean, we, we, weren't, we weren't having these conversations about what's missing um, when people were watching TV or listening to the radio or receiving free newspapers. We weren't imputing basically values of those services that consumers receive for free back in the 1950s or 1960s or 1970s and 1980s. The, the, the discussion has to some extent arisen today because it's happening at about the same time as we expected productivity to be boosted by the digital economy. But it's not because of the, the absence of the valuation of free um, that's driving that. Now, in our, our view, certainly within official statistics, is that the concept for GDP remains robust. Um, there are some challenges around measurement that have always been there and have been exacerbated by digitalization, in the, particularly in the context of prices. Um, so it, perhaps it's useful to think about the, the issues in two different ways. One is in terms of what's missing when we think about nominal values and what's missing in terms of the way that we think about real GDP growth. And I think that's a helpful distinction to make because if we think about, for example, the absence of free within the concept of GDP, then we're having a conceptual discussion about what the boundaries of GDP need to be. And it's a much easier conversation to have when we talk about the user constituency. You know, do you want, as users, to have a concept of GDP that includes, basically, growth that's driven by more hits on YouTube, for example, or more people sitting down play, you know, looking at Facebook? I mean, that would be the ultimate goal of those who want to include the valuation of these free services within the production boundary. Um, but I think that does a disservice to those who are using it for other purposes. Now, our approach to responding to this is not to say that it's not important. It is important. It is important that we try to provide measures of consumer surplus, or at least provide pointers that allow people to understand that a large part of the phenomena in terms of mismeasurement is really about the, mis the absence of measurement of free. Um, and so what we're proposing um, within the international statistics community, not just within the OECD, what we're proposing is not just to have perhaps a better visualization of the industries, the producers of digital goods and services and the users in terms of the, the products that are being consumed, um, but also addendum items or additions as by way of satellite accounts that try to bring us closer to this notion of well-being or your GDPB as, as you refer to it um, within that one of, I think, one of your penultimate slides. Um, because we, we realize it's important and we realize it's a way of basically aiding or at least assisting in the debate. Um, but let's, let's also think about, for example, what else is not in GDP. I mean, if we think about, for example, the whole range of services that we produce for ourselves, you know, our cooking services, our cleaning services, they, they've never been in GDP. There have always been arguments that they should be in GDP because to some extent they're a displacing activity. You could ask somebody else to come along and do the cooking and cleaning for you, and that is in GDP, but when you do it yourself, it isn't. And that's always been part of the conversation, and we've never included it for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because it doesn't meet this third-party principle in terms of you have to be able to transact it. And, uh, the other, but the other, of course, is that it will have a massive distortion to the notion of GDP. You know, even if we use um, relatively low prices um, to value these 
free goods and services that we receive, not the digital ones, but the free goods and services that we receive, we would end up basically having an increase in GDP in most countries of about 40 and 50 percent. And that has serious policy ramifications because all of a sudden, you know, you see that poorer economies would become middle income economies and, and, and all of a sudden that has a very different emphasis in terms of the way we think about aid, for example. But that also extends, I think, to digitization. You know, when we think about how valuation of these free goods and services impacts on other notions of the macroeconomic accounts. And so, for example, at the OECD, we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years, again, to try to improve and inform the debate around well-being, that we need to think about household disposable income as being an important tool for policymaking as well as GDP. And, and if we extend the argument that we should include free within our notions of household disposable income as some form of production, we've also changed the notion of what income means to individuals. And what we will see is an equalization, you know, a, broad, I mean, a, a flatter um, measure of inequality across income groups. And that flatter measure of inequality just reflects the fact that people are going to be using these free goods and services um, in, a, in a sort of equilibrium way. So you, you, end, you end up having you know, this argument, you could, you could, if you want to take it to an extreme view, is say that actually you've never had it so good to, to those at the bottom of the income scale turning around and saying it's okay because you know, you've got all this access to YouTube and Facebook you never had, what are you moaning about? And, and that's not really what we want to see in the accounts. And this is why it's important that we, can, we continue to have this distinction between what GDP is and this notion of GDPB. I mean, I, I would perhaps argue for a different language around GDPB, I mean, perhaps something half, halfway between GDP and, and well-being. And GDPB, I think, gives the impression that it's perhaps something that can be used in, in a better way or instead of um, GDP. And I'd argue perhaps that, that we shouldn't do that. I mean, just thinking through perhaps some of the, the issues around the paper, I mean, one of the things, of course, that sticks out, and I think it stuck out quite a lot, amongst the audience was the valuation of what's up, this 540. And I think that uh, most of us would conclude that's perhaps pushing it a little bit in terms of um, what the real valuation is. And, and this, this took my mind back to this, um, this endowment theory, and it wasn't mentioned in your paper. Um, but I mean, there's a, there's a long line of psychological theory that looks at the willingness to pay versus the willingness to accept giving up something. And, um, and we have this, as consumers or as individuals, we have loss aversion. We generally value something much higher once we already own it to, to that that would actually pay for it. And I think that, that rang true very clearly in the estimates that you had for WhatsApp. Um, perhaps less so for Facebook, but I would still argue that there's a, an issue there. I mean, I, I, I don't use Facebook. I would pay nothing for it. Um, and I wouldn't, absolutely nothing. I would never pay anything for it at all. But that's my own view. Um, <laughs> I mean, but, but there's also another issue, and I think this is perhaps more philosophical in terms of what price measurement should be. Um, because when we think about, for example, this notion of the reservation price, and the reservation price is something that reflects the price that's willing to be paid by somebody who we assume to be representative, but almost by definition not representative because they are paying something at a much higher price. And that, that's always been a bit of an issue for me in terms of the way we think these things through. It, it wasn't clear to me within your paper um, whether or not the, the average growth that you were referring was an average growth that was looking at a fixed set of prices, I think it was in 2003, or you were looking at the average growth using um, basically previous year's prices, because there would be a difference that I think is being, is being pushed through from that. Um, so anyway, I think from, from our side, we have done some of this work, and we have tried to, to value an awful lot of this. And we've taken a slightly different approach in terms of looking at the, the values of Facebook and the values of Wikipedia. And we've taken a data approach, and we've looked, for example, at the actual volume of data that's being produced by consumers and used by Facebook. Um, and we've looked at market prices for actual transactions in data and tried to estimate Facebook, or the, the, the additional value of the consumer surplus, if you want, um, that's generated by Facebook using that approach. And it's much smaller um, than the results that you have. It's not to say, of course, that your results aren't great. I mean, I think we welcome within the national accounts community any um, addition to the debate because we know that we are perhaps catching up a little bit in terms of making sure that, um, that we're in a position to be able to respond to what needs to be done, certainly with the next revision of the system of national accounts. And the next revision, I'm pretty certain, will include an awful lot more commentary around basically the, the importance of making sure that we have free 
included in the accounting framework um, in some way. Um, perhaps the last point, and there are many others that I want to make, but I know I'm hogging in the time. Um, in, your, in your paper, you also mentioned um, this notion of GDPB being used as a, a notion for productivity measurement. And I mean, that, that one got me scratching my head a little bit um, because it's difficult to see how all of a sudden this addition of consumer surplus to this notion of production from a firm perspective um, was going to play out in productivity. And, and just thinking through as a national accountant, what we would see under that schema is that the same asset was generating basically two sources of revenue, double basically, because we've got the revenues already being generated through advertising. Um, and then you're going to add on to that this notion of consumer surplus. And so again, that, that for me is another reason why it should be outside of the production boundary. Anyway, thank you. I thought the paper was great, the work's excellent, and it's going to be very useful for all of us. Thank you. I think it was very helpful to have uh, a clear framework. You put everything uh, in, a, 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 in a, a framework with clear lines. Um, and also, um, I like also your historical uh, uh, beginning. Um, so uh, let's keep in the discussion that there are also other methodologies that they find other values. And uh, that is an open thing for research and uh, to discuss uh, how to proceed. Uh, you mentioned that the motivation to look at this uh, now is the so-called productivity paradox. To what extent do you think um, such kind of digital services contribute to this paradox? Can they explain it? I think you're asking me a question that many have been scratching their heads over for an awful long time. Um, um, as as a, a statistician, um, I would say that mismeasurement is not the place to start looking. I mean, there are a whole range of other reasons why I think that we're, we're seeing perhaps um, a slowdown in productivity and pointing the finger at mismeasurement is perhaps the wrong place. Um, I mean, we, we've certainly looked at mismeasurement in some of the more traditional areas, I mean, but those are the exacerbated by digitalization. So, for example, uh, in the price of digital goods and the price of digital services, we do see that there are significant differences in the deflators that are being used by countries. Um, and we've done some work that tries to adjust for those deflators using the most extreme examples that we observe in countries and imputing that value to a, the, the, every country's um, GDP measures. And we see that that has an impact maximum impact to about 0.2, 0.3% on GDP per annum. Now, that's a significant change in growth, but it's insignificant compared to the, the productivity slowdown. So it's not explaining away the productivity slowdown. Now, the addition of free, of course, is a different way of thinking about the productivity slowdown, but we're also talking about a very different concept. You know, the slowdown that we're talking about at the moment is the slowdown in GDP as we currently understand it, um, and not GDP plus these new bells and whistles. Thanks, uh, Nadim. Uh, Avi, you can respond after we have the panel round. So I turn now to Elin. Um, I mean, uh, the common uh, underlying, uh, let's say, commodity, if I can uh, asset better, is data. And uh, its policy implications on the value created, on uh, how it is used and processed, uh, and uh, on the welfare implications it has. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you very much, Georges, and thanks uh, for this presentation and fascinating work. I'm really humbled to, an honor to be here. Thanks for, for this, for this work. I think it's an excellent idea to, to want to change or adjust or supplement the GDP. Uh, it's not necessarily a new idea, but I think an improvement along the lines of your work could definitely be uh, welcome. Uh, so we know GDP is the sacrosanct um, yardstick for measuring uh, uh, economic health. It's not necessarily perfect, uh, uh, but it does doesn't necessarily pretend to be the perfect uh, measurement either, but it doesn't really, you know, the, the, what, the reason why we're discussing this today is because it doesn't account for the intangible, for, for digital in particular. Uh, the problem, by the way, with GDP is not it's not just academic. Uh, it's, uh, Stiglitz mentioned that it could be partially blame, be blamed for the uh, 2008 economic crisis uh, because we would be overlooking other metrics like uh, indebtedness. Uh, but now, uh, okay, the GDP measures the value of services and, and goods that are being bought and sold. Uh, and so many of the greatest technological innovations of the internet age are free, and so they're not accounted for. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's a good idea to try to take into account uh, this, uh, this element in increasingly. What I like about your proposal is that it shows that, um, uh, you know, I've heard some proposals from, for instance, Jaron Lanier uh, and Green Wine. And Jaron Lanier said that uh, companies like Facebook have created a meaningless economy. 
And your work shows that's definitely not the case and that people do seem to value the internet quite a lot and this is really good news. And also one thing you, I think in your own words, you mentioned how um, uh, th this could represent an improvement for policymakers and decision makers to, to make better decisions. Uh, and I totally agree with that. I think uh, uh, it would definitely change the way in which we invest in digital uh, infrastructure and digital education. And too often have we seen uh, regulators making decisions uh, about a technology without really fully understanding uh, how the technology involves and, and what digital means. However, sometimes it's nice to try to be the bad guy uh, and try to critically read uh, uh, stuff, uh, and, uh, even though your, your study is wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm not an economist, again, so I'm just going to discuss from the perspectives that I, that I work on. So my question first was, um, if government agencies are increasingly trying to change the GDP or to, to modify it or supplement it, I'm wondering why. Uh, so maybe the reason we're pointing out this mismeasurement of the GDP is you know, the fact that we're not measuring the digital economy and that we would have been adding a half a percentage point uh, by including it over the last decade. Uh, maybe the reason is because productivity growth is still slow. Uh, and Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, I think in his work about the second uh, machine age, uh, uh, said that, uh, that the technologies should lead to an increase in productivity, but this is still not showing up in the stats. Uh, technology's uh, full impact has yet to be felt, so that this modern productivity paradox. So maybe that's why we're trying to, to really uh, tweak it. Uh, and GDP is often um, uh, open to official manipulation. There's always this desire to enhance it. Um, so if we introduce or somehow how uh, add the GDP B to GDP uh, or taking into consideration, that would substantially increase GDP, that would make governments look good and that would, uh, that would uh, reduce their um, uh, debt to GDP ratios. And the consequence of that could be that policymakers would be diverted from focusing on policies that support productivity. Uh, and that it could encourage them to continue to rely on a passive policy framework. Uh, and no one really wants to talk about productivity because it sounds like uh, job loss talk, but nevertheless, uh, I think that could be one drawback that I identified. Uh, in line with this, um, so I see a problem with this solution to quantify the, the digital sector by attempting to establish how much an average user of a free service would pay if it wasn't free. So this approach allows for this consumer surplus um, uh, to, to estimate it, uh, which is the, con the difference between the consumer's willingness to pay and the amount that they would actually pay. But that would throw up um, a substantial surpluses to the to the GDP and boosting it significantly. And that does flag um, a, a a conceptual problem, I think, because the precondition for an exchange of goods and services uh, for money is that buyer the buyer perceives that this good or services is worth more to him or her than the payment for it. Uh, otherwise, the transaction doesn't really take place. So the supposed consumer surplus is not an additional factor to the transaction. It's really the reason for it. So it shouldn't be added or shouldn't supplement the GDP in an attempt to potentially boost the statistics. Uh, sort of in the same line, <clears throat> you're using this willingness to pay a test uh, to determine the hidden value of something that's, uh, that's free. But there's potential for respondents here to game the survey. So they were asked whether they would prefer to keep using a free online good or to name a price that would compensate for losing access to that product. But it's one thing to say how much a service is worth and another to actually pay for it. Uh, respondents are told, as you mentioned, that one in 200 would, would receive the cash value for the like for for abstaining from the digital service, if I'm correct, uh, but surely a reasonable person surveyed would uh, would uh, would say that they're prepared to pay an artificially higher value for the service just to maximize the the potential payment for abstention. So that's a a, a big one point I wanted to bring to the table, um, and another one is. Another question I, I, I thought of is, are we not forgetting the alternatives uh, and are we not forgetting that it's difficult to anticipate how the digital landscape will evolve? Uh, you raised a couple of caveats in your, in your work, in your paper, including the need to include more goods and to do more online choice experiments to get a more accurate picture uh, of it all. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, what about the other providers of digital goods? So we have um, Google search. If I, if I give up Google search, yeah, can I, can I still use Bing? That might affect the respondents' uh, answers. If you look at the search engine markets, uh, there's Google, there's Bing, there's Yahoo, there's Baidu, Yandex, DuckDuckGo, messaging apps. We have WhatsApp, but we have Messenger. We have Telegram, Discord, Viber, all of that. For uh, uh, web browsers, we have Chrome, Safari, Firefox, but we also have 
and don't laugh, but we do have Internet Explorer, 2% market share. Um, so this is also another point that I wanted to bring. And if uh, I evaluate the value of the digital goods with Google in mind, but not DuckDuckGo, that may also, or Ecosia, the German uh, uh, company, that might also change significantly um, uh, the, the value I'm, I'm, I'm giving, I'm estimating. And maybe, you know, when it comes to emails, um, some people decided to stop using emails and use Slack as well. Maybe that's another kind of service that should be uh, included. Also, your experiment is based on, a, on an average of Dutch students in a lab, lab experiment. So you do point out that women and men value the, the, those goods and services differently. But what about developing versus developed countries? What about high income, low income? Uh, WhatsApp is very much used in Europe, but perhaps less so in the US. Um, so this is an Another, uh, another way to say for me that how would you get to that level of granularity and then scale up that measurement that you're proposing to a global level. Um, how to also anticipate the way technology companies will evolve. Most of, most of those companies you looked at are relatively young, but they could be broken up. Let's say some policy proposals are saying they should be broken up. Maybe they will be broken up. Maybe they will merge. Maybe they will be replaced. Maybe they will become less popular. Facebook is now for grandpas, and people are using uh, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, something we didn't really talk about a couple of years ago. So this is, uh, again, another way to say it would be difficult to make that measurement agile in time uh, as the landscape is continuously evolving. You mentioned also, well, the best value, the best way to value digital goods is to ask people directly. I'd like to push back on that a little bit because if you ask people directly for for some things, you might run into a couple of issues. So for instance, let's say a GP. There's a consensus on how much a GP should be paid because he's responsible for our healthcare. This is something tangible. This is something we evaluate as a basic need. But what about the specialists behind all that? The infrastructure maintained by computer scientists the, you know, to, to, that can help us avoid data breaches, that can protect our data, that can ensure the services are delivered continuously. Maybe the, you know, no one would get to a consensus about these guys' paychecks and because just people don't have the transparency and the knowledge of all of this. So just to push back a little bit on, on this one. And finally, uh, being mindful of time, another risk I see, um, and for me, forgive me for bringing it to the table, but I think it's a fascinating topic again. And uh, the, the, your proposal could backfire on consumers. Uh, it could give thrust to more tech lash framing. Uh, it could uh, give thrust to more regulatory shortcuts and ir irresponsible uh, proposals, which, I, which I've seen and actually we've discussed a year ago here at, at Brugge. Uh, first point, let's say consumers say, oh, I'm ready to pay $1,000 or more for Netflix. Uh, Netflix sees that, huh. but I'm only asking consumers to pay $10 or $20 a month now. So that means I could ask for more. Governments could see that, oh, people seem to value those services a lot. Maybe I should tax them. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, the government tried to suggest to tax uh, WhatsApp communications, and people well, that was one of the reasons why people took it up to the streets. So I, I think giving a, that could give a free pass to these kinds of issues. Uh, another caveat you raise is that, uh, like traditional GDP, uh, GDPB does not capture all the potential negative externalities. Basically, all the harms that we're blaming and accusing online platforms uh, for, uh, such as uh, abusing, uh, uh, you know, consumer by violating their privacy, uh, being responsible for mental health um, uh, problems, uh, damaging our happiness, damaging social cohesion, distorting political discourse, etc., etc., imposing all sorts of costs basically on, on society and the users. Um, and there are proposals, for instance, from US senators or policymakers to force companies to disclose the value of the data to consumers. So, and there's also uh, proposals for data dividends. Uh, Glenn Weil again suggested that users should be paid for their data. But the problem I have with that is that the, the exchange of data is a fundamentally different exchange of values than, than for other transactions. So it's non-rivalrous. You can use it simultaneously. Multiple users and companies can use it, can share it. If consumers pay with their data, uh, they retain the same amount after a transaction. Uh, so it's infinite in that way. And it's also not a zero-sum game. Benefits um, businesses and consumers alike. Uh, also, if you try to split up the profits and distribute 
uh, money to consumers, say you use Google and Facebook's profits annually, split them and distribute them, you would um, this would amount to vanishingly small kind of money. So I don't think that would excite uh, anybody really. Um, also, that would potentially damage uh, business models of companies. You know, they would have to adjust their subscription models. So, um, you know, all of that would not necessarily benefit users. While at the moment, platforms are treating them to the same, um, they're, they're equally treating them. So I apologize if I took up too much time. But again, there were a lot of points I wanted to bring up. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much, uh, Helene, for uh, the uh, numerous uh, dimension uh, you covered. And, um, I'm sure that uh, Avi uh, has many pages of notes there. Uh, but uh, uh, we are, um, uh, I mean, we don't have so much time, and I want to keep uh, time for the audience to ask, so I will go directly to David. Well, thank you very much. Maybe I can speak uh, at 1.5% the speed now. Uh, uh, well, 1.5 times the speed is what Netflix now is offering its users as a as a playback option. So obviously you get 30% more output from, from that. Um, thanks, Avi, for the presentation. I mean, uh, it's, it's clearly inspiring because uh, I'm currently running uh, with some co-authors uh, similar stuff in the UK. So we'll be very curious to see how, how this kind of compares between, between the economies. Um, we, we slightly tweaked it, but I mean, we're having a conversation on that. Um, I think since we're here to discuss um, how should we measure the digital economy, I think um, there's a couple of really interesting questions that I um, kind of want to put out. And first is kind of what is the digital economy? And I think uh, Nadim kind of um, touched upon that already. Um, for what purpose are we actually measuring it? And then what's the difference to kind of the non the non digital economy? So why is it so so topical now? And I think. Uh, if, if, if you think about the digital economy at anything that's um, enabled by digital technologies, that, that's kind of a non-starter because that's that's almost everything um, nowadays. So I think about it more as the internet economy, like for, for the purpose of of this talk here. And of course, that's massively increasing. In the UK, we spend six hours uh, a day online, two of those um, on mobile devices. 90% of people um, are watching videos online, 80% uh, bought something online in the, in the last month, and we have seven social media profiles on average per person. So obviously it has a large impact on, on, our, um, on our everyday life. So, but what's the value of, of it all? And I think, because uh, it's not 42, um, I think uh, we prefer to, the, the way we think about value is, is always like, if I prefer something over something else, that means I have a preference, that means it has value for me, okay? So that's, that's the way I think also your research is actually um, uh, thinking of it. And if the digital economy then gives us more choice or better choice, then that in the end should actually impact our, uh, our well-being or, or at least welfare. Um, I think the, the key point here, and, and you made that very clear, is this kind of substitution between uh, between digital and non-digital non goods, or especially free digital goods, actually. So that decoupling of GDP as an indicator over time um, for, for well-being, I think that, that's really crucial. So I think that, that kind of uh, that correlation, because it's not about levels as much, so I wouldn't focus on the absolute numbers, but it's really about the changes that we should be interested in, what is becoming more, uh, more valuable uh, relative to other things. So I think that, that's, that's really interesting. That's where you research um, comes in and and of course um, it, it's about change in, in consumer surplus but um, that's particularly important as you pointed out if it's zero price and marginal cost the the interesting thing I think is that is the large similarities to to public goods or environmental goods so um, in the study we're doing now we, we're trying to extend that uh, framework and actually ask people also about let's say the value of, um, of of clean air or a public park or something. So I think there's a lot of potential to to start thinking about the, the kind of large questions that have always been around. And now we can we can kind of at scale for very cheap ask people these kinds of questions. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, I think the method works really well for individual individual goods, but I do wonder about this kind of adding up constraints. So I think there's a lot of substitutability, as, as was just pointed out, between these goods. So I, I wonder if we just add all of this up, this is a big number, but I, I'm not sure if that's really representing the, the value to, to, the, to the individual because of these um, substitutability um, in fact, and, and still, um, we do need a metric to, to kind of decide which good we actually are including in our survey. And, and I think 
pure number of users or something is a starting point, but we need something deeper like engagement, I think. Um, but of course, I mean, the, the nice thing about this method is that it can deal with the issue of disappearing goods, which has always uh, been around, because if you ask people now what's the value for MySpace, it's going to be zero for people. So I think that that's a really neat way to, to get into that one. Okay, um, the question is then, how meaningful is such a measure um, uh, at, at scale um, of, of these um, as a free, free goods kind of increase? So I mean, what I mean by that, how going forward, if, if there's more uh, digital goods or free digital goods around, is, is there an upper bound, right? Is there something we can, um, because in the end, people are still, you're asking for monetary value, so people will uh, make comparisons in their mind to what this money will buy them on the market. Um, and of course, that's in fact uh, affected by inflation and, and, and these kind of things. So that will drive changes over time, but at the same time, um, of course, what's available in the market, and if that's less over time, I'm just thinking 15 years ahead, you know, how will such a measure um, uh, look like? I think there's a lot of uh, challenges to uh, official statistics. I'm just going to mention very briefly. Um, generally, the digital economy means there's a lack of information on prices and quantities. Uh, there's almost infinite numbers of uh, customization we can customize down uh, to the individual, and there's constant upgrading of, of, of digital goods. And so hedonics is a non-start, I think, for a lot of these things. And uh, quality adjustment is really is the key uh, point here that if we want to improve uh, GDP, we need to think about how can we actually quality adjust um, these things. And I think that was uh, mentioned before. OK. Um, the, the, the question is more like, is there some fundamental que uh, challenge to GDP here? Um, beyond the kind of, okay, we, we can improve the, the measures that we have. And I think the interesting thing here, I agree with the panel, is, is really the role of data. What's the, what's the value of, of data as a basis for monetization or business uh, models or value creation in general? I think we do need more research on that. We need to be open to new um, new approaches. And, and we actually, we need data. And that's, I think, um, a lot of these uh, markets are being dominated by large few players that are operating globally, so it makes it very, very hard to to get um, some of the data. Okay, um, so if there's any uh, internet company out there listening, then we would like to have your data on doing more research. Um, okay, final point, something that we're working on uh, right now at the uh, at the ESCO with colleagues uh, Diane Coyle and Leonard uh, Nakamura. We are thinking about the shadow value of time, because we think uh, that's the, the kind of crucial um, resource as we substitute between market and home production. What doesn't change, obviously, is, is, is how we choose to spend our time. And, and we still always have to make that decision. Sometimes it's really good to spend more time on something. Sometimes it's a pain. So it's really that that's the kind of that's the tricky thing. But that has never changed. And Seneca uh, observed that 2,000 years ago that you know time is the ultimate uh, resource. And the, the day still has uh, 24 hours. And the kind of competition for our attention uh, is on, as Tim Wu uh, noted. OK, if we then turn to uh, a nice anecdote, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix in 2017, said, we're not competing with um, Amazon, as you might think. We're competing with sleep. So that's kind of um, something that was being picked up. Then I found that very re revealing, actually, that you know they really see where can we get more time from people. It's probably not from competition. It's, it's from sleep. And now, as you know, Netflix is offering uh, to watch videos at 1.5 times the speed, and I really wonder if that actually is a quality improvement or not. Um, are we getting to the policy implications later, or shall I touch uh, upon? Please go on. Very quickly. Um, so I think the, the, the main implication here that we haven't touched upon yet of the digital economy is the environmental foot footprint, and I think that's uh, something that has, has, has to be understood. If you, th if you take Bitcoin as an example, um, that uses as much electricity per year as Austria as a country entirely. So, right? so I mean, we're to be talking about a lot of energy, co electricity consumption, and carbon footprint by a lot of these um, these things. I think you posted a question to the panel before: Is it fairly distributed? I think there's really large issues here. Um, digital economy or digital business models require really large upfront investments that take a long time to see profits. Uh, marginal units. Uh, like the, the price of the marginal uh, unit that you supply is often zero. You can access the uh, the world via the cloud. Talent will 
kind of agglomerate in few places, and that obviously means that we're going to see larger um, spatial disparities in the future, which I think is a policy challenge out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you also for bringing the issue of having access to data to do research, because this is very important. Um, uh, so, I mean, um, Avi, we heard the panelists. Um, uh, obviously, uh, we don't have so much time to respond to everything. Could, you, could we have a summarized response of a few minutes, and then we open the floor for questions? Yeah. yeah, thanks to all the panelists for the remarks. Uh, and echoing Nadim's point, I again want to stress the fact that the goal is not to replace GDP. GDP and productivity, you know, they've been developed over now 70, 80 years. They do a really good job at measuring the production side of the economy. And our goal is to, in parallel, as Nadim was mentioning, it could be like a satellite account looking more at the welfare side uh, and especially focused on the digital economy because as I was mentioning the welfare and production uh, equation changes with zero price digital goods. Uh, regarding the point about you know free goods always existing that's exactly true you know we always had a television and radio and uh, uh, and other free goods which also generated a lot of consumer surplus and this is the this is what we want to measure as well. We want to look at changes in welfare from these goods over time. We cannot go back in the past and run our studies because we cannot go back in time. But the goal is to keep track of all of these free goods, digital and non-digital goods, such as public goods, environmental goods, and see the changes if, you know, if people are getting better off from using them or they're becoming worse off. And again, uh, echoing David's point, uh, we are not very interested in the absolute levels, but rather the deltas, the changes in these valuations over time. Uh, if you look at things like clean air, you know, like we need air to breathe, so consumer surplus from air would be infinity. But a more interesting number is if the quality of air has changed over time and how that impacts your welfare from being able to breathe clean air. So that change is more important than the absolute number. Uh, and Another point regarding negative externalities, I absolutely agree. When I mention that Facebook generates 40 or $50 of consumer surplus, I'm not saying that it's great for you. It's generating this much of consumer surplus in dollars, but that doesn't mean that you know it's actually good for you. It's still an open question, you know, whether that forty dollars is similar to like let's say, you know, if you smoke cigarettes, you probably get a lot of consumer surplus in dollars but it's not good for your, you know, maybe your physical health. And the slide which I mentioned towards the end is that if you want to look at the entire equation, we should be looking at economic well-being on one side, which is captured from production point of view by looking at GDP, from a welfare point of view by looking at our metric, and we should also be looking at happiness, life satisfaction, mental health, and a series of metrics if you want to look at the overall health of the economy. So that's the point. You know, instead of looking at one number, we should be looking at this entire spectrum of metrics. Uh, maybe we can. Thank you very much for the time efficient response. So uh, I will open now the floor for questions. If there are any reactions what, uh, on what the other panelists said, uh, we can uh, include it in the concluding remarks uh, after the questions. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, Edward Christie, uh, I'm an economist by training, not a statistician, but nevertheless I'd like to support uh, Nadim in his uh, defense of, of GDP. Uh, I think if economists uh, took a tiny bit more time to look at exactly how GDP is constructed, uh, they, they would find it, uh, they would be less likely to, to criticize it. So a very brief remark is that a lot of uh, services that have a price of zero at the point of consumption uh, the uh, inherent uh, value added is captured in GDP if the business is uh, financed by other means, for example, advertising. So I'm not sure how much is not captured. It might not be that much, and, but, but then that's a question back to the panel. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll collect collectively some questions. So there was uh, there, uh, one, uh, yeah, here, there, and there. Yes, so I'm, I'm also an economist. Um, I have some uh, a question regarding the consumer surplus because if I remember it correctly, uh, you obtain and I think you also said that you you obtain consumer surplus also from consumption of other completely non-digital goods. No, you have a competitive market price, and then if I value whatever the breakfast cereal is above the market price, and this is my consumer surplus. So now, if I basically uh, 
I understand that it's, it's interesting to see the consumer surplus for specific digital goods that are zero price, just because they're zero price and therefore we're not observing anything about them. But actually, if I want to go from this measure of wealth, uh, consumer surplus for a specific good to something that's uh, a bit broader or, or in a sense kind of comparable to GDP or GDP B or something like that, wouldn't I have to then compute all the consumer surpluses for all the goods that are in the, in the economy to just kind of um, get something that's, that's actually comparable? Because if I don't do that, I don't, I don't, I don't see how that's directly comparable. So I think that's, that's my, my main question. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Todd Buell. I'm a journalist with Law360 here in Brussels. And I have a question uh, for Avi or really for any of the panelists. Uh, what are the implications, do you think, of your research on efforts to tax the digital economy? I write about tax issues and have followed efforts to tax you know, the so-called GAFA companies for quite some time. And I mean, how appropriate is it maybe to try to tax something that, as your research shows, is maybe hard to measure. So I just throw that out there to you and to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, citizens. Angelos Harlaftis, EPAFOS Advisors. Uh, I'm uh, working the last 11 years here in Brussels mainly to the um, edges of technology. So I'll offer to the community, the economic community, uh, another perspective. Because here we have, and we thank Bruegel, which is uh, bringing to us the American perspective. But we as Europeans, we have to study better the things. And uh, what about China, for example, digital economy? Digital economy is not a Facebook. It's not, uh, these are institutions under common agreements. So digital economy is sensors, actuators. That means that today, for example, the last 10 years, we're experimenting in Switzerland, for example, with the mobile phones. We know how everything is moving. Because economy, one of the facts, factors of the economy is the movement. Uh, the economic movement. Uh, so we can detect the movements of the citizens. The, we have, uh, in the future, we're going to have smart uh, wearings. We, we are going to detect everything. So uh, I don't believe, uh, as you do also, that GDP is, is a very uh, old uh, index. Uh, we are discussing a lot of years, so we have to change it, but uh, because we don't know well the future, but we know it also from the artificial intelligence, um, which is the direction. Because in the future, we push a button, and the robot or the artificial intelligence is going to tell us how many is the income of today in Brussels of the retail shops. We, we can have it. So it's a matter of privacy of the, of the tax authorities and the relation with the business, the discussion. And the new factor has to deal with these things, because also, for example, in the mines, the robots are going to, to occupy the sector, already has done this. So the movements of the robots, they, 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 they describe the economic um, impact. So the, the new indexes, indexes and not only one, will have to deal with a lot of new things which yet are not in our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Avi, you go to respond and then feel free to step in at any of the questions you want. So a quick point regarding the advertisement revenues and other ways some of these platforms capture some of the value. So it's important to know that so there are two sides of the equation here, how much value they're creating and how much they're capturing. Platforms such as Wikipedia are truly free. They don't show up at all. Platforms such as Facebook and Google capture some of that value through ads. But it's interesting to see that because fundamentally these are zero marginal cost digital goods. So in a competitive market, the price would be closer to zero. So the value which these firms are able to capture is a small fraction of the total value they create. Uh, there is research, as I mentioned before, done by Bill Nordhaus, who shows that over the last 100 years, firms with technological innovations were able to capture only 3 to 4% of the total value they created because of the zero marginal cost aspect. And the rest, 96% of that value went to consumers. So I would say that you know we should be looking at both of them, GDP and productivity directly or indirectly looks already at the value which is captured. And if you want to look at welfare, we should also look at the extra value which is generated on top. Uh, coming to your point about you know, what all goods which we, believe, which, uh, we should be looking at, you're absolutely right that you know, we should look at the entire 
basket of goods consumers uh, consume. And this is what we plan to do moving forward. So what we're doing next as we scale up our research is we are getting a representative sample of goods from the CPI basket, you know, goods with positive prices. Uh, as you mentioned, even for those goods, the welfare side is on top of what people pay. On top of that, we're also looking at the most popular digital goods and other goods such as environment and public goods, which are also the value welfare gains are not captured properly in GDP. So moving forward, we plan to create this basket of goods and keep track of changes in welfare for these goods over time and potentially also across countries. And this lets us look at you know, differences between uh, advanced and developing economies in terms of how much of the welfare you know, people in developing economies, let's say, get compared to people living in advanced economies, because fundamentally everyone gets access to the same Facebook for free. So those are all interesting empirical questions which we want to tackle moving forward. Uh, thank you. And um, when we talk about the future and the future of work, about robots replacing us, um, well, that is uh, for sure a concern. However, uh, what we have already uh, been observing is a shift uh, of uh, people to uh, new occupations, uh, new tasks, uh, which uh, can, uh, are not so much uh, affected by robotization. Uh, any other comments from the panel? I just wanted to pick up on this, this issue of... Uh of taxation, because I mean, we didn't really touch on on taxation in, in either in discussants or in, in terms of the presentation. But that, that probably wasn't the purpose. But I mean, th there is this this nexus of globalization and digitalization, which is causing difficulties. And and it's fair to say that even within the accounting framework today, you know, we have challenges when we think about digital assets, um, you know, IP assets in particular, th those assets that can be moved across borders. Um, in a very simple way, the, the flick of a switch and you find them somewhere else generating GDP in a different country. Um, and, and that is an issue, um, both in terms of the way we think about GDP and GNI, and many of you um, would be familiar with um, what happened in Ireland back in 2014-15 when there was a relocation of uh, some multinationals um, to the Irish economy and, of course, the GDP growth that was driven by the relocation of those intangibles. And that, that's, that's a problem for the, for the accounting framework, and we're trying to develop um, much stronger guidance in terms of the distinction between what we call economic versus legal ownership um, in the system of national accounts. And so that, that, that is a problem. Um, it's not a problem that would necessarily explain the global productivity slowdown, because what we will see is GDP shifting from one country to another, um, and so you'll see productivity growing somewhere, but perhaps um, decreasing somewhere else. Um, so that, that is a challenge. Now, in terms of, of how, it's, how this all um, relates to it, I mean, certainly um, this, this idea that free um, will enter the system isn't really part of the discussion. And we're fortunate enough to have somebody from our centre for tax policy. I'm not sure he wants me to, to point the finger at him. Um, but, of course, you know, within the OECD, we developed some guidelines only recently with pillars one and two um, that are looking and exploring ways in which we can get a better handle um, on taxation, which is taking sort of a turnover-based approach. And that turnover-based approach in the context of these GAFA um, would be looking at their turnover, um, you know, the, the sales they're actually generating within ju different jurisdictions. There's a challenge, of course, in the sense that the turnover that they record in a given country may not reflect the sales they've made in another. But certainly the sales-based approach um, provides you with a, a, a sort of an instrument um, that is less um, um, flexible um, than perhaps some other approaches. I mean, for example, you, you could use a way of apportioning profits that is based on employment within the, the jurisdictions, the various jurisdictions of the, the, the multinational, but then you end up creating another potential distortion where you will see labor shifting across borders in, in an attempt to um, evade or avoid um, taxes. Um, so that's what, that's what I really want to say. I mean, perhaps we can have a, a discussion afterwards. Thank you. Any other comment on tax or something? Do you want to say something on tax? Hmm? No? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other question? There is one there. Bruno, yes. Thank you, Georgios. Bruno Basalisco from a consultancy, Copenhagen Economics. Allow me to thank Georgios and all the speakers, and first of all, uh, Avi, for the interesting presentation. One question on, on method. When we think about uh, from the horse's mouth, from the consumer's point of view, uh, the valuation of different services. When thinking about digital services, of course, network and uh, and the the, the network uh, effects are key for for many of these services. Um, you, you said that the um, you explained that some of your questions 
double click and try and figure out which part of the valuation depends on parts of the network of being able to connect with others, with peers. Is it, is it possible with this method to, to uh, separate, how clearly is it possible to separate between the value that the consumer gives to the current digital technology, um, given that everybody else or many others of, his, of, of peers are on the, on, the, on the network versus a scenario where the, the network, the technology for one or many firms does not exist? I mean, is it the valuation of one person to be part of an existing network versus the fact that there are networks around? And I, I guess this applies to different business models. Um, uh, how close are we to, uh, to measure this, uh, this challenge between the two scenarios? Thank you, Bruno. Any other question? Okay, ah, there is one hand there, yeah. Uh, thank you, I'm Ruth Passaman from the Ruth Passaman from the European Commission, and uh, in my career, I've worked on social issues and on, on statistical issues. So, trying to put those two together. Um, so, the issue, <laughs> the the point that uh, a part of the economy has never been uh, measured is is very old. Is the typical story that if you marry your cleaner, GDP goes down. So, uh, this is not new. The point is whether the effects are more distortionary now or not. And uh, and all and then I would also. <laughs> Add the, the the point that uh, if uh, you know being on Facebook for two, two hours a day, it, it reminds me of the story of of um, of uh, you know old people living in a really big house, so that looks like they're super wealthy, but actually they don't have money to eat. Uh, to eat, yeah. So it's that same kind of uh, of uh, conception. So. Basically, what I'm trying to get is, what is the policy implication of this debate? What is the, the implication of looking at these three dimensions that you have put in there? If, you know, the implication, there is a policy implication only if there are distributional differences in the way actually you then look at the, at, at, you know, the different measures. And how, what can we assume that those different distributions would be? Otherwise, who cares? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit... <laughs> Thank you, and I think that is an excellent question to close also the panel. So, um, Avi, you, would you like to start by addressing the two questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, good point regarding network effects. So uh, the method lets us, you know, also measure network effects, as I was mentioning. So we could ask you and your friends together to leave, or just you to leave, or you to give up half of your network. So you could ask various questions of the sort, and this lets us get at network effects on these platforms as well. Um, Regarding your question of uh, if there are differences in distribution across these platforms, so exactly, I think that's true. Like for example, what we find is that for some of these services, let's say if you look at income, uh, there is no correlation, while for some others there is a strong correlation. So if let's say you know if someone is richer and they spend much more money in the economy, they would show up more in GDP, but because you know by definition they're spending more, but. What we find is that, let's say, for social media, both uh, richer and relatively poorer people seem to get an order of mag like similar levels of welfare. So there are distributional differences, and I think that's what is it makes the digital economy interesting. Uh, and as I was mentioning before, uh, there might also be differences across countries. Uh, you know, my prior would be that some of the developing countries are quite technologically advanced, like in India, countries of Africa. Uh, so the welfare which they get from these digitization as a proportion of their income might be significantly higher than in the advanced economies. And I think these are all interesting open empirical questions which we should be looking at moving forward. Uh, thank you. Before we move, always, I forget to ask you, uh, in your uh, slides, you had that the valuation for Twitter is zero. Um, I mean, <laughs> can you explain a little bit? Yeah, so uh, so the, that valuation is to have an account on Twitter. And with Twitter, you know, because you can consume content without having an account, many of the users seem to, you know, passively browse Twitter rather than actively tweeting out. So they don't value having an account as much as being able to just go to, like, you know, let's say the president's Twitter account and get information. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Concluding remarks, policy applications, oh, we hear about this distributional uh, issue, and what are the instruments you could use uh, for uh, uh, addressing uh, concerns associated. Do we talk about tax? Uh, is it regulation uh, the correct approach? Uh, we talk also about breaking up uh, the digital firms. Uh, how radical it should be? Uh, final thoughts, David? <laughs> Anything else on the wish list? 
I'm not sure if, if breaking up is the, the right starting point to think about. I think it's it's more uh, the, the problem is much, much deeper in terms of how how kind of the, the value can be uh, created. And I think the, the key issue here, I think, is, is the kind of global nature of a lot of these uh, business models that can kind of, you know, you have to like become big before you can, you know, or, or you fail, kind of. So it's 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 kind of the scale to, uh, to the the, the race to scale. Um, I think and that's that raises a lot of competition issues, um, which I think um, are um, are really crucial because going forward, who, who with, with, I mean, already now in the digital economy, it's dominated by 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 um, by, by companies from from China and the U.S. mainly. So I, I, it's really the scale of a domestic market, which means you can you can be uh, successful in, in, in these types of business models. And I think that's something uh, to keep in mind who going forward then will derive the value from from it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Elin, uh, so do you see that distribution of value issue emerging and be worrying uh, by uh, re having less value for our users and uh, get more value to the platforms? Or is it uh, something we should not worry so much about? Uh, it's not that we should worry or not. It's more should we give in those uh, temptations and, and, and believe those proposals which sound all very, very good and very beneficial on paper. We should not give in into that because that would probably lead to more digital inequality. Uh, your, your data might be worth more or less than mine. Uh, but what does that mean? What does it mean, the value of data? It's um, often valuable because it's an, it's an aggregate uh, very often. But also when we talk about the value of data as a um, market power. Um, we're talking about data access and sharing data. That is useful to talk about it, but what is also important to keep in mind is that data is valuable when it's actually useful, when you can use it. Uh, and often we run into interoperability problems. Uh, we don't have the right data sharing mechanisms. Uh, maybe policymakers could consult with industry what makes sense to be shared and, and why sometimes we have to be careful with that. I mean, there's uh, IP rights to consider, there's security to be considered. Um, some mechanisms that could work would be uh, data trusts, for example, sector-specific data trusts. So I think it's the discussion really is the value of data, how do we evaluate that, but certainly not trying to distribute it just as any other commodity, if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Nadim, you covered the task policy aspect before. Uh, do you want to, uh, do you have any further remarks? Uh, Perhaps something else that was missing in the debate is also the, the labour implications. I think that when we think about policy, I mean, there are implications in terms of employment and labour policy. Certainly, when we think about the gig economy and gig economy workers, and we're doing a lot of work at the OECD and with a number of other organisations as well um, to get a better handle on that, and just in terms of job quality and uh, the labour market effects. Thank you. With respect uh, to that, there is also a very interesting uh, new law in California that uh, I understand that it is also evaluated by European authorities. So, thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, let's thank the speakers for uh, being with us and having this interesting insights. Have a nice afternoon. Enjoy Brussels. <laughs>